first slide that we are showing here is the basic tools and equipment required for fiber pulling. So we are seeing here interesting things. Again, the breakaway swivel, cable slitters, many types of pliers, buffer strippers, some quadrants, guidance hardware, mandrels, cleaning equipment, pulling grips. We'll be seeing some of these things a little bit more in details. You guys have to have most of these tools available in the field. So we are going to start with lubricants. Lubricants are obviously facilitating cable installation, but they have to be compatible with both cable sheath and duct inner wall components. That means that they must be water-based. Do never use detergents, industrial oils, that is strictly forbidden. Depending on the type of lubricant you use, you will need to pour more or less quantity. So you must follow the provided instructions. There are different ways of applying lubricants into ducts. You have a manual application. We do not prefer this one. The one that we prefer is by pumps. The following videos will show the difference between manual application and pump application. Hand application of cable pulling lubricants is preferred when installing cable into horizontal duct systems, when pulling without the use of a feeder tube, or when working in a vault or handhole situation. Hand application can ensure that the entire cable is evenly coated with lubricant. A thorough lubricating film is essential to reducing overall pulling tension. Use a thick gel lubricant like Polywater J, Polywater Plus Silicone, or Dyna Blue to get the best results. These lubricants are easy to pick cable while pulling. Feeding the cable directly into the duct bank with a feeder tube makes it easier to lubricate cables by being above grade and out of the manhole, providing more room to operate. Before pulling, scoop a few handfuls of lubricant into the duct before the head end of the cable to help pre-lubricate the conduit. Front end packs can also be used to pre-lubricate the conduit ahead of the cable too. American Polywater manufactures several pourable cable pulling lubricants Pourable lubricants are effective for vertical pulling situations, such as conduit stub-ups and feeder tubes. Pouring lubricant directly onto cable as it enters the mouth of a conduit or feeder tube is a great way to avoid messy hand contact. Lubricant quantity is important. This formula shows how much lubricant to use during a cable pull. If a pull has multiple bends, high conduit fill, water in the duct, or is in an old conduit system, the calculated amount of lubricant may need to increase by as much as 25%. A general rule of thumb is to use one gallon of cable pulling lubricant for every 100 feet that you're pulling in cable. After the pull has been completed, cleanup is easy if you follow this tip. Get a good clean rag and start four to six feet back from the end of the cable. Tightly squeeze the rag around the cable and squeegee off the lubes as you pull towards the end of the cable. Take the rag and fold it over, exposing the dry part of the towel, and repeat the process. Your cable should now be clean and dry ready for taping and termination. The mess with hand application. The best pumps are designed for water-based materials and pump a broad lubricant viscosity range at acceptable flow rates. Polywater makes several pumps. The LP3 is a hand-operated, self-priming, piston-style transfer pump. Both liquid and gel polywater lubricants are pumped through the LP3 by adjusting the mechanical advantage ratio setting. The pump instructions include ratio setting recommendations. This adjustment is quick and simple, as is shown here. The LP3 pump mounts directly onto a 5-gallon pail. A 10-foot output hose is standard. Operate the pump with the up and down handle. Increase or decrease the rate of pumping to control the lubricant flow rate. The Polywater Pump LPD5 is powered by a quarter inch or large electric drill. The LPD5 will pump all Polywater lubricants except the very thick gel DynaBlue. An extension feeder tube allows the LPD5 to draw from a five gallon pail 
or 55-gallon drum. The pump is supplied with a 12-foot output hose. Vary the drill speed to control the lubricant flow rate from the LPD-5. When finished, reverse the drill to return the majority of lubricant from the output hose to the bucket. An appropriate lubricant pumping rate depends on duct size, cable count, and pulling speed. Even for large conduits, pumping rates required are generally less than one-third gallon per minute, one and a half liters per minute. Pump the required lubricant volume at a rate that evenly distributes the lubricant over the length of the cable. A slightly heavier coating is recommended for the first third of the pull. If a pump is not going to be used for a while, clean it by pumping through water before storing. American Polywater makes three hose attachment lubricators that work with the pumps. The first, which is supplied with all pumps, is a flexible cable guide attachment. The lubricating cable guide works well in a vertical stub-up conduit. The lubricating sleeve guides the cable into the conduit and protects it from the sharp edges of the duct. Lubricant is applied on the cable as it enters the conduit. Position the lubricant output port towards the first inside bend of the conduit so that lubricant is coated on the rubbing side of the cable. Both gel and liquid polywater lubricants can be applied through the flexible sleeve lubricator. The second device, a hook adapter, works best with a feeder tube or vertical conduit. Attach the hook to the output hose by sliding the hose over the long end of the pipe. Then secure with a cable tie or hose clamp. Position the hook so that lubricant flows onto the cable surface that will rub on the first conduit bend. In a vertical position, the hook adapter applies both liquid and gel polywater lubricants. There are several different types of lubricant applicators that you can use to apply polywater lubes to cables. Open this split device by releasing the hasp in the middle of the applicator. Place the device around the cable or wires and refasten. As lubricant is pumped into this applicator, the internal applicator flaps coat the cables as they pass through. Control the pumping rate to completely coat the cables, but not overfill the sleeve. Lubricant applicators can be used in horizontal or vertical applications. Gel lubricants are recommended to prevent lubricant dripping. In summary, choose the pump, applicator, and lubricant that works best for your job. Several are available. Use the polywater calculators, then use the pumps and collars to thoroughly coat the cable jacket with lubricant. This will optimize lubrication and minimize cable pulling tension for an easier, quality cable installation. We come back to the slides. The next one is about the installation by pulling using capstan winches. We have rarely seen you in the field using winches, but this is the most convenient way of installing cable because it warranties a uniform tensile load and speed in the cable installation. Capstan winches are used to support on the cable pulling because they are motorized and then they facilitate the task enormously. There are two types. This one up here is the one mounted in the support trucks and this one down here is the standalone one. Both of them operate in the same way. The capstan is this wheel that you can see here with different sizes. The size has to be in accordance to the cable you are installing. Remember the minimum bending radius. A rule of thumb for STC cables is that capstans with 800 millimeters diameter accommodate all our cables. Just a hint to help you out. So if you install 800 millimeter diameter capstan wheels, you make sure that all STC cables are meeting the minimum bending radius. Otherwise, if you install smaller capstans, then you have to pay attention to the MBR of the cable you are installing. So how do we operate a capstan winch? So you see down here on the drawing how this is basically working. So we have the feed truck where our cable drum is installed. The cable is being pulled from this manhole to the far end handhole or manhole. The winch is installed on the other side, obviously, and the winch is initially pulling the rope once this has been attached 
to the cable head and then the winch is recovering all the tape or rope and once that's done the cable will start passing through. Precautions that you have to have is that the winches and all machinery has to be leveled and stable on the ground. The alignment of the cable drums and the cable winches has to be at least within plus minus 10 degrees of the pulling direction. You have to use the proper hardware to guide the cable in and out from the tugs and manholes to the truck and winches and monitor the tension. The winches are equipped with tension monitors. You have to set the tension to stop the winch automatically if the tension force exceeds 85% of the maximum tensile load. Now we are going to see a uh, demo video on the utilization of capstan winches. You can appreciate how the operator is looping the pulling tape around the capstan. Two loops to secure the uh, pulling tape. And then uh, they tie up the uh, tape to the winch. The winch diameter is much smaller. It does not meet the minimum bending radius, but it has all the pulling force. So this is why they are using the capstan wheel that ensures the minimum bending radius is met. They start the winch. The pulling rope starts being rolled over the winch. And after the entire length of pulling rope is rolled over that winch then the cable will appear from the uh, duct The pulling rope length is completely out of the duct and then we are going to see in a minute how the cable, here we go, how the cable head comes out as well. The operators stop the machine right when the cable is going to get to the winch because one more time the winch is not meeting. Now we are going to talk about assist winches. In some cases, when the section to be installed is very long, and in all cases beyond 300 meters, we can make use of an assist winch to cover in one shot that cable span so long. How this works is basically shown on this figure here. So we have our cable drum on the right hand side here and then the first winch that is the assist winch is installed in the middle of the section. So this winch will be pulling the cable all the way and then this pulley, this is a simple pulley making sure that the cable goes smoothly inside the last section and then we have the main winch pulling the cable. So we have two winches operating, this one and this one. The one in the middle is what we call assist winch. Because of the extra forces that uh, happen in longer span installations, we have to make sure that the maximum pulling tension that the winches are set to is 80%, not 85 as before for single spans, but 80%. As I said, don't install assist winches that are closer than 300 meters. So between winches, at least 300 meters.
Remember that in all installations, making use of pulling forces, you have to use breakaway swivels. It is a critical component. It is protecting the cable from tensile overload as well as cable twisting. These breakaway swivels have different setups that can be fixed by means of metallic pins. It is a very simple piece of hardware that adds a lot of performance, let's say, to your installation. Please ensure that you are always using them. These pins are preset to break away, and that's the reason why the swivel is called breakaway swivel at a determined tensile load. So you change the pin and the tensile load that this swivel withstands changes as well. So the variety of pins, variety of tensions. Pulling lines are a better option than pulling ropes. The tapes disperse load over larger duct surface area, which reduces the frictional heat. They have very low elasticity, so the fluctuation in pulling tension is avoided with them, whereas pulling ropes increase the risk of overpulling due to those fluctuations in the forces. They can be pre-lubricated, and the pulling ropes cannot be lubricated. They come with foot markings, so you can easily read distances with them. May be available, if needed, with copper wires inside that help being detected from the surface. And they are typically much lighter compared to pulling ropes or to the same size. You can observe in this photo the pulling tapes. They are flat, nylon made or polyester made. Another important element in cable pulling is the pulling grip. The mesh pulling grip that you can see on the right hand side in the top right corner of your screen. This is a critical element in a proper installation, provided that you use it properly. Here are the main rules that you have to follow when choosing the pulling grip for your cable installation. The first thing is that they have to withstand the tension applied in the pulling line without damaging the cable. Install that pulling grip, physically tying up the strength members. So it has to be mechanically coupled to the strength members. The pulling force has to be applied to the strength members, not to the cable sheath alone. The grip has to be at least 60 centimeters long and withstand at least five times the maximum cable pulling tension. We are going to see now a short video about the utilization of pulling grips. The trick to a proper installation is to select the right pulling grip and that is determined by first measuring the outer diameter of the cable and then consulting with the pulling grip manufacturer for the right pulling grip. Once that is determined, the rest is easy. I'm going to wear my gloves first. Once the right pulling grip has been obtained, inspect it for damage. What you're looking for are broken wires, bulges due to excessive stress, rust, and things like that. Also give it a small tug there and uh, smooth it. As you can see, I'm wearing leather gloves just to make sure that I don't injure my hands. Look at the cable end. It's now time to install the pulling grip itself. Rule of thumb is the pulling grip that fits over the cable without excessive difficulty is the right pulling grip. So we'll just insert the cable on the end and we will use a pumping action to get the pulling grip onto the cable. As you can see, with the right pulling grip, it's relatively easy. So we're going to stop about a quarter of an inch from the basket, so that looks about right, right there. Smooth the mesh over the cable, and also give it a small tug to make sure everything is snug. And then we're going to apply electrician's tape, starting at a point one inch from the end of the mesh. And we have to wrap the tape really tightly to make sure that the mesh is fully compressed against the cable. A good measure of how tight the tape is being applied is to be able to see the imprint of the wire mesh through the tape. Occasionally give the cable a pull just to make sure everything is still tight. 
and continue wrapping. We are now ready to connect the cable to the pulling rope or pulling tape. Remember that the aramide yarn in the cable has to be attached to the pulling rig. Now, talking about placement hardware or guidance hardware, you can see down here different types of guidance hardware. For example, here the quadrant on the left hand side is a very convenient piece of equipment that is rarely used in Saudi. This duct coupler as you saw in the video for the lubricant, it may be more convenient and more easy to use. It can also provide pump lubrication. This is a very convenient piece of equipment that we prefer as placement hardware, especially for bigger ducts, 32 millimeters and above. Guidance hardware like this one that is allowing you to do 180 degrees it is not preferred. STC installations must be straight so we are not in principle allowing this 180 degrees installation unless there is something preventing us from placing the installation equipment drums and so on at the left hand side here which is the right place to do a straight installation you can also see pulleys and other quadrants down here that are helping out installing cables but because of their complexity in utilization, I guess that you guys would be quite unlikely to use them. Remember that this material intends to protect the cables from rubbing them against sharp edges at the same time as it protects the cable against bending radius not meeting the minimum requirements. And uh, remember that you have to clean them, keep them clean at all times and pre-lubricate them because these rolling pieces need lubrication. Last but not least, they have to be firmly fixed so that the cable doesn't move while being installed. Now we are going to talk about subducting. Large ducts cannot be used to directly install cables in them they have to be subducted. We have here on the left hand side of this table the two sizes that STC is using as large conduits 110 mils and 75 mils. Depending on the patient status, if they are occupied or not, we can install a different number of subducts inside. If they are not occupied, and they are 110 millimeters. We can install five ducts of 32 mm or seven ducts of 25 mm outer diameter. If they are occupied, just the viable number of ducts to get up to a 50% duct filling ratio. This also applies for the 75 mil ducts. If they are not occupied, the 75 mil ducts can be subducted with three. 32 mil subducts or 5 25 mil subducts. Remember to always keep the ducts and subducts sealed. So you have to use the end caps and all sealing material at all building entrances, manhole and handholes, at every single point in the network where the ducts and subducts are terminated and especially if they are not to be used for blowing so they are bigger size they have to have a pull line installed last but not least remember the rule that only one cable can be installed in a single duct whatever the size is if the uh, conduit is large and you want to install more than one you have to subduct it obviously subducts protect the cables and allow for a smooth uh, cable installation. Some words on the uh, microduct bundles, just to illustrate that they can come in many different versions and types and sizes. You have some examples down here, even mixing up the size of the microducts, making use of all the small spaces and taking the maximum profit of the existing infrastructure. So they can be uh, directly buried, like this case here with a thick sheath, or subducted, like this case on the left hand side, that cannot be directly buried. They are supplied in different wall thicknesses, 
and diameters and all that you can imagine. So this slide is showing basically different types of inner ducts termination. Some of them are smooth walled, some of them are ribbed, some are corrugated. Depending on the application and manufacturer, you can find different uh, termination of the inner walls. What we have to make sure is that only HDPE ducts and subducts are used. And these, especially when using micro ducts and blowing, have to be rated to at least 12 bar. This means that they have to be certified that the minimum pressure they withstand while blowing is 12 bar. Not only the ducts and micro ducts, but also all the coupling and adapting components, end caps, adapters, couplers, etc., have to be rated to a minimum of 12 bars. As we have mentioned before, the jointing of the ducts and micro ducts is as important as the installation procedure of the ducts themselves. There are different types of jointing methods. For micro ducts and ducts of the size we use for FTTH, they are typically mechanical jointing. We are not actually welding conduits, as it could happen for bigger size and different material ducts. So this is the typical uh, dot coupler or adapter for the large size dots. We will see as well when talking about micro, micro ducting and fiber blowing what the uh, micro dot couplers look like. Important point here is that you always cut the dots and micro dots with the duct cutter, which is the tool that you have at the bottom left of the slide. This is the only tool allowed to cut micro ducts and ducts. Do never use a saw that is not allowed. About duct inspection and integrity test, obviously before you install any cable or any subduct in a conduit, you have to do the duct inspection, cleaning and rubbing to detect any kind of damage or obstructions in the ducts. This is obviously applicable to existing ducts that we are trying to subduct or install a cable within. So how do we do the inspection and integrity test? Well, the technique is called rodding, as you see on your screens. That is basically inserting a rod into the duct all the way through. If the rod is not passing through, it gets blocked on the way, you have to identify where. This is the reason why these rods are usually having distance marks. So you can easily measure how much of the rod went inside the duct. Make sure that the roads are clean and everything is free of contaminants. We are gonna see now techniques to clean the conduits and ducts. Obviously, these make use of uh, mandrel tests to make sure that there is no blockage first. So um, mandrels are these piece of equipment that you can see down here. Okay, these are mandrels. Depending on the size of the duct, you will use one type or another. And before the mandrel goes through inside the duct, we typically install a brush that is cleaning the conduit. The cleaning pads come after the brushes to remove any residues. Then finally we have the mandrel. So all this is attached to the rope head and then a, a, it goes all the way through. Mandrels are not recommended to be used for ducts that are smaller than 50 millimeters, which is always the case for FTTH. So typically mandrels are only to be used for copper conduits or conduits that are existing from other installations that are going to be reused to be subducted for fiber. This is the mandrel test that we are showing down here. This is just a summary of the concepts that we have already seen. So we would be passing through quite quickly. Uh, you can see pulling techniques uh, with the eventual help of intermediate operators in handholds or manholes. And then the manual installation requires a lot of manpower, but these are to be distributed along the cable span. So there are operators inside the manholes helping pull the cable. 
not as you usually do that you guys get all together at the end of the cable and then pull together from that cable end that is not a correct technique the tension would be too high in that case you have to use intermediate pulling by means of operators helping out inside the intermediate handholds all this is to keep in mind the maximum tensile load remember and never exceed that. All right. While using cable pulling techniques, there are several ways of installing the cable. Depending on the cable length, you may choose one or another one. Down here, we have the back feeding technique. This technique is just facilitating the cable installation in longer spans just by placing the cable figure eight in the middle of the section and pulling the cable on both sides. You can even do it simultaneously. Additionally to the back feed technique, we have the forward feed technique with the cable being pulled in the same direction. So it is based on the split of the section onto shorter sections or shorter pulls. This is carrying out a lot of cable in the pool, so beware of not exceeding the maximum pull intention. In order to further extend the length of the cable sections, that you can install, we may make use of assistance. So this assistance is also helping out on the longer cable spans, as we said. A last word about cable coiling and racking in manholes. Once you have installed the cable section, remember that you have to follow the requirements in terms of cable slack loops that have been delivered to you together with the designs. Between 15 and 20 meters are required for most cable uh, sections except drop cables that require between 2 and 5. The cable slack loops requirements are down here. For standard cables we have to leave 20 meters of cable slack loop A manufacturers providing these racks where the spaces between these holes are foreseen to hold the cable loop and this cable loop being tied up with the tie cord between them. Cables are preferable protected inside manholes, inside corrugated ducts.